Hello, it's just David here with my weekly email. Um, when Vladimir of Rus was offered the hand of marriage of an imperial princess, he knew this was an important moment. However, Vladimir had to agree to one thing, to uh, have this for himself, and that was he had to be baptised. So he was uh, baptised and in return received the uh, princess's hand in marriage. From there, Vladimir returned in triumph to his capital. That capital was Kiev. And then the whole people of Rus, unto then pagans, came to the river to be baptised. That day is known as the baptism of the Russian people. It happened in 988 and it was based around the capital that Vladimir had established in Kiev. The Vladimir there is of course not Vladimir Putin. It is St Vladimir from over a millennia ago. There is big history between Christianity and Russia that perhaps we need to understand. We enter a very dark and tragic time now, perhaps not seen certainly since the Cold War, maybe not since the Second World War in Europe. To understand some of what lies behind it, However, I think we need to look at some of the religious background. I think one of the things that we've got wrong in the Middle East is not understanding that people today will fight and die for their faith. It's something in Europe that we just don't really expect. Well, perhaps at least in Western Europe. But people are serious about religion, sometimes crazily serious, it has to be said. But nonetheless, uh, it means they are willing to fight and to die. When the Roman Empire um, fell, uh, or the Western Empire based in Rome, uh, to the pagans and, and went through a sort of uh, a, a period we know uh, loosely as the Dark Ages, the seat of the empire moved to the east to Constantinople, based after, named after Constantine, a city which then became Byzantium and today is Istanbul. If you'd ask people in um, 1000 uh, AD who they were in Istanbul or uh, Byzantium as it were of them, they would have said we're Romans, even though they were hundreds, uh, perhaps maybe even a thousand miles away from Rome. They saw themselves as the inheritors of uh, the Roman Empire. Eventually, of course, that fell to the uh, Turks, to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and so the seat of Christianity, uh, if you like, or the idea of a Christian empire shifted north. It shifted north to Russia and there it was overseen by the Tsars. The Tsar word Tsar is the same word as the word Caesar. Of course this carried on until the 20th century very much uh, the Russian people saw themselves as inheriting that great sort of imperial Christian past of both Rome and uh, Byzantium. That was, of course, overthrown by communism, who tried their best to get rid of it. However, it plainly didn't work. And once communism was overthrown, so Christianity in Russia, particularly through the Orthodox Church, uh, again, uh, was much rejuvenated. Apparently, there's one time, I don't quite know if it's true, but three churches a day were being opened in uh, Russia. And the cause of the Russian Orthodox Church was very, very close to that of the Russian nation. 
whether you like it or not, Vladimir Putin, uh, maybe for political or military gain or whatever, allies himself very much to uh, the Orthodox Church. He talks about Christian culture. He thinks in terms of Holy, uh, uh, Holy Mother Russia. That's how he uh, thinks about it. And so we see from that bit of history I quoted at the beginning of St Vladimir uh, coming from his capital of Kiev um, and therefore the Russian people to be baptised, uh, as say, over a, a millennia ago. Um, you can see why Kiev is such an important part of Russian history and certainly of Russian Christian history of Holy uh, uh, Mother Russia. Um, add to that a bit of church politics. Um, one of the things that happened at the Reformation was that we were, as you know, uh, particularly with Henry VIII rebelling against the idea that the, the, the church could only kind of be run in a top-down model with the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, at its head. Why couldn't each nation um, have its own sort of church on friendly terms with others, like the Church of England, um, but, um, you know, not interfere in each other or, or have to get special permission to do anything it wanted to do from um, some higher authority. And that's the way the Anglican Church works today. Sometimes we think that the, the Archbishop of Canterbury is the head of the Anglican Church. He's not not really. The uh, churches of the Anglican Communion are, are a family of churches. They're, they're pretty autonomous. There's things of bonds of friendship that unite us together. But um, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury can't tell the church in Uganda or in America what to do in the way that perhaps the Pope can. And the model of that kind of you know, autonomous churches bound together is very much the reformers looked to the east, to the Orthodox Church, which operates in that way. If you like, the equivalent of the Archbishop of Canterbury, very roughly, is the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew, at the moment. Uh, and Constantinople, as you, as you uh, may remember at the beginning, is, is Istanbul. Uh, it's the old, na old Christian uh, name for it. And until recently, um, many other Orthodox churches, such as the Russian Orthodox Church, looked to um, Constantinople, uh, you know, to, as, as other churches looked to Canterbury, which belonged to that family. Three years ago, in 2019, the Orthodox Church in Ukraine broke away from the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, just as, you know, the Ukraine had broken away uh, from the Soviet Union. And um, the, the Russian Orthodox Church did not like that at all. In fact, so much so that whilst the ecumenical uh, patriarch in Constantinople recognised this new church, the, the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, um, then actually the, the Russian Orthodox Church split off uh, from them, if you like, uh, left the family. And so there is a kind of religious dimension uh, of what's going on there, a breakaway uh, church asserting its independence just as uh, a, break a, a, a breakaway nation asserts its independence. As I say, this is something, a bit of, sort of history and church politics that lies behind perhaps what's going on and perhaps isn't much reported and isn't much uh, understood. Now, I want to say sort of a, a couple of things that we might learn from this. I mean, first of all, the dangers of equating um, churches with overly nationalistic um, causes. I think uh, I'm a great admirer of orthodoxy, actually, in terms of theology. But there is a sense and, uh, in which uh, many of the orthodox churches are too much identified with the nationalistic um, um, hopes of, of, of where they find themselves and therefore uh, too much 
in thrall perhaps to their political leaders and indeed political leaders as i say as as like putin who will who will use the church as a kind of tool to uh, kind of bolster his own position and uh, 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 get the support of the people i think the sort of second thing i want to say is i see the dangers if you if you say well you you want to understand this that that somehow that in English, it often means you want to, well, you must have sympathy for, for, for Putin and what he wants to do. And I want to say very firmly, I have no sympathy at all. I think this is a, a terrible, awful thing that Putin um, has, has done, sort of reminiscent of a sort of fascist gangster state. I can't really condemn it strongly enough. But I think it's more like, you know, I mean, when the police say, um, you know, we're, we're trying to understand a serial killer. I mean, it's not the police saying, you know, we, we're, we're, you know, quite sympathetic to serial killers. It's simply saying that, you know, sometimes just saying people are mad or crazy or deranged doesn't help to stop them. That actually there is a kind of crazy logic, a very dangerous logic that you need to kind of understand in order to, to stop them, because at least you get to know what they're after, what they're trying to achieve, even if, if that is uh, really quite evil. So I think it, it's only in that sense that I want to understand what's going on uh, in Ukraine at the moment. Uh, I want to understand it really because I want to stop it. Um, and, um, you know, that, that's what I mean. So I think, you know, there is a, there's a sort of religious, a very, very sadly, a religious dimension to this that is over, overlooked. Uh, as I say, I think we do need to, to understand that an important, you know, uh, place uh, uh, and history that Ukraine and Kiev in particular has in the minds of uh, many Orthodox people. Um, and just to beware of the lessons it might tell us. As I say, I think we must very much pray for the people of Ukraine. We must pray for peace, but I think we must also pay, pray for justice as well. Um, it is, you know, uh, perhaps likely there will be peace fairly soon, but that peace may not include justice for the Ukrainian people. Um, and indeed, of course, also for the Ukrainian church uh, as well. Both Russia and Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine, the Ukrainian nations are ones which identify themselves very proudly as Christian, have sort of big bits of Christian history attached to them, as, as indeed uh, most of Europe does. But we need to kind of make sure that we understand that and that we uh, honour it and see behind what's going on so that, as I say, we might end up in a place where there is justice for the Ukrainian people, where they can uh, assert their will to be an independent nation uh, and they can do so without the threat of violence. The moment that seems a hope that's quite a long, long way away. I hope you'll join in your prayers with me, the hoping that somehow, with God's help, those aims might uh, come a little bit more realistic and a little closer. Thank you.